Welcome back to another episode of Rocket Vlogs. Happy Super Bowl Sunday if you're watching from the U.S. Go Cincinnati. I don't want the Rams to win again. I thought we'd do a little bit of a different video here and uh, go over all of my flights in 2021. Now, I believe I added it all up and my total Newton seconds was in the O impulse range just by myself, not including joint flights with my dad. So that's that's pretty good and I don't well, I probably will beat that this year because of one flight. Um, we'll get into that later. But before I get too far into this, let me just remind you guys, we are only 430 subscribers away from me giving the uh, AMW White Wolf 4-inch kit that's behind me away to one of you guys for free. It's not cheap to ship it, but I'm going to pay for it just because I like you guys being here. It was given to me by Gloria and Robert from AMW, and I decided to give it away well, they gave it to me to give it away, but I decided to give it away when we hit 10,000 subscribers, so we're very, very close. If you're watching this and you're not subscribed, please press the button below. It's free, doesn't cost you anything, and if you are subscribed, please share it with your rocketry friends who aren't, and uh, that way everybody has a fair shot at winning this thing, and I can get it out of here finally. First thing I'm going to do is pull up the Rocket Vlogs YouTube channel and start digging through all the videos of 2021. We're going to start with what I believe was my first flight of 2021, and that'll be my 3-inch Punisher at Tripoli Vegas' Spring Fest event. I flew my 3-inch Wildman Punisher in Las Vegas on a Aerotech K1100 to 4-grain Blue Thunder K motor because I had never hit 10,000 feet with that rocket before and decided that I want to. Annoyingly, it went 9,900 feet and change, so I actually have a K1275 to take care of that, and I'm hoping to do it at Spring Fest this year. We'll see if I have time. But uh, I made a cool video about tracking rockets, so uh, I'll, I'll put links to all the videos that have these flights in them in the description too, so if you want to go check them out on their own, but I am going to include clips too. This one, unfortunately, they had armed two pads at once, so one rocket took off that wasn't mine. I believe it was a minimum diameter rocket on the K-185, and then my rocket on the K-1100 took off next to it. And just to make a point for how not outdated RF tracking is, I even set the tracker down at the flight line and um, watched the other flights and filmed a couple other flights before I even bothered to go look for my rocket. So uh, put RF trackers in your stuff because... Very rarely do you lose lock on the way up like a GPS tracker. And next on the dock is my 5-inch Wildman Punisher. If you go to the Wildman website, you won't see the 5-inch Punisher available for sale. Myself and my buddy Taylor asked him very nicely to make us a couple of 5-inch Punishers with 3 16 fins and 98mm mounts because we thought we were going to be hardcore like that. And I do have to give Taylor credit. He flew his on a 98 millimeter motor before I did. I really want to put an N1000 in mine, but one, they're very expensive. And two, I'm a little bit afraid of the fin flutter. It's in the low mock range for a really, really long time. It spends a lot of time in transonic range too, which is when you can really run into problems. If I shred that rocket at max Q, that motor still got like another eight seconds of burning. So there's a good chance I'll never see the thing again if that happens. It's really unfortunate because I would hate to lose the rocket. I'd really, really hate to lose the hardware more than anything because that motor case is not cheap. If you aren't familiar, go look up the price of an Aerotech 9815 360. Yes, if you can afford to throw that across a field in Kansas, I'm happy for you, but I sure can't. Anyway, first flight of my 5-inch Punisher ever was at a Tripoli, Idaho event here in Idaho just outside of Boise. It was a Aerotech M2050 propellant X. It was my first time ever seeing one of those motors, and it quickly became one of my favorites ever. Reminds me of the old um, CTI M2245, which for a while was the go-to level 3 motor. Uh, it's just loud, it's fast, it's punchy, it's powerful for a really good price. Price went up a lot, so it the, uh, the value went down in terms of impulse a little bit there but it's still the most potent m motor you can buy for the 5120 ks and it's super super cool i liked it so much that i bought another one that i flew last year as well and we'll get to here in a little bit so let's see what else we got going on an xrs i didn't fly anything there my cousin did his level one though shout out, uh, shout out shane on your successful level one so it looks like the next thing I flew anything at was indeed LDRS. Uh, that was, of course, the first and only flight in my possession anyway. 
of my seven and a half inch or two thirds scale iris sounding rocket. It was all fiberglass, seven and a half inch diameter, quarter inch G10 fins, a blue tube coupler that I had wrapped in carbon fiber, um, 12 feet, four inches tall, I believe. And with the end motor in it on the pad, it weighed 82 pounds. It is not a joke. That is a big, big rocket. It was pretty insane. Um, I dreamt that thing up when I was about 16 because a friend of mine named Jim Scarpine has a seven and a half inch rocket called Star Leopard. And uh, I just wanted to fly something big and like slow takeoffs, super, super cool. And uh, I decided if I was going to do it, I was going to go big. And I was going to spend the money on an end motor. And we can't fly Sparkies in Idaho. So I was like, I have to do the N2220. The 98 millimeter, six grain, dark matter load from Aerotech. And I'm sorry if anybody from Aerotech is watching. It was just so gutless sounding. I love, love the look of it. And the pictures of it look phenomenal. And the onboard footage, because I had my brother 3D print me a camera shroud so I could put a full-blown GoPro on there and shoot it in beautiful HD footage. So, so good. But man, the motor just sounded so gutless. It really, really was a bummer. Um, of course, also a bummer was uh, cracking the fillet on landing, knocking one of the fins loose. These things happen. It's a big, big, heavy rocket. And it was coming down around 20 feet per second which is probably okay on a softer surface, but probably a little fast for anything that big in general, but especially for dropping it on the Bonneville Salt Flats, which is basically as hard as concrete. So, uh, you know, you live some, you learn some. Of course, um, there's also the footage you can see where the fins were actually draggier than my drogue parachute. But the fins were creating more drag than the chute. So you can see the fin can catching air with the fins and going up above the upper section of the rocket. And it would start streamlining. So the fin can would speed up because the lower section, the upper section still had the parachute open. So the fin can would straighten out into its perfectly aerodynamic form and blaze down at the upper section that's still going slower than it because of the parachute and it was just smacking it so those quarter inch fins did a little bit of damage to the seven and a half inch gel coat nose cone that you can't even buy anymore but uh that rocket's actually now in the possession of my friend rex who's getting uh, he's redoing all the the fin stuff and he's having it repainted very nicely and uh he plans on flying on an m1939 which should be pretty awesome uh, other notable LDRS flights, I flew a K456 Dark Matter, the iconic 0% K motor, and it's, <laughs> it sounded so much better than the N. One uh, ignition. I hate to say it. I feel bad. because I, It's not like I didn't like flying an N motor. I was just, man, I've seen a bunch of footage of those N2220s from like LDRS 38 and other launches where they just like, you can almost feel it through the video and we were standing there and it just sounded like a blackjack motor it was a lot of money to spend to just be like eh, it was okay um but you know you win some you lose some again uh what else i fly at ldrs i don't think anything actually because i had a couple rockets there but we had a rain day so i, I think it was just the n2220 and the k456 because i was uh trying to situate uh, helping my dad get everything set up and ready for his level three as well my dad got his level three uh six inch stinger from rocketry warehouse an old kit that's long retired i think mad cow sold it for a while after they bought all the rocketry warehouse stuff um but m1297 the classic and then he did the same thing i did celebrate the level three by flying an l um we both did m1297 level three in the same weekend did an l1040 his L1040 Dark Matter, again, it was better in the end, but it still, still just didn't. <laughs> quite hit as hard. For reference, here's a video of my buddy Taylor's rocket flying on an L1040 that was absolutely brutal sounding. And <laughs> that's what made me want to fly one. Anyway. That's LDRS for you. Now that brings us to Airfest. 
Airfest was, uh, I decided to get pretty bold and wanted to hit 20,000 feet. I built a uh, 54 millimeter minimum diameter rocket. Used to be a Mad Cow Tomac or Tomac, however you say it, two inch minimum diameter kit. I shortened it way, way down so that we could barely, barely fit a CTI Pro 54 6XL. I've since got another one. Um, if you aren't familiar with the story, that should give you some insight. Uh, rocket took off great. Um, no reinforcement on the fins or anything. It flew a CTI K300 classic long burn. Great motor for high altitude stuff. Without the tail cone on there, it was simming, I think, around 21 and a half or 22. Didn't put the tail cone on it because I didn't apply for a high altitude uh, waiver clearance guy for uh, Airfest. And I don't want to make Bob Brown mad. So I was like, okay, we'll do the regular closure. We'll fly this in the next year. We'll set it all up. We'll do it good. We'll get way, way up there. But unfortunately, we didn't get a chance for that to happen. Um... I recently started theorizing that I may have put the main parachute out at Apogee, and I'll be honest, it was, the next day it was beautiful, I really should have just waited, but I was really anxious and wanted to go, and I had it ready to go, and uh, I had, at the last minute, decided to use the longer coupler that came with the kit, because it came with two couplers, uh, because I was flying a head-end deployment, and I didn't take into consideration that adding extra length of the coupler would make the case not fit. So with about 15 minutes left till the waiver closed, uh, Taylor had a hand held little hacksaw blade. I took the whole electronics bay apart, cut everything open, shortened the coupler, cut my actual sled down so that I could still fit it inside the coupler, and then rotate the altimeter, put everything back, make sure everything was wired correctly, and it did deploy, I can tell you that much, but I think there's a chance I may have swapped the e-match leads and put the main out at apogee in my haste to just get it done and get it on the pad um it was a little breezy and there's a little bit of cloud cover and uh yeah so rocket probably went somewhere between 18 and 20,000 feet we had a beautiful tracking signal on it for what seemed like a reasonable amount of time for a dual deploy flight to land it was about three and a half four minutes and then the signal disappeared, like it does sometimes if you land, uh, you know, in a valley or something. Oftentimes when the rocket's on the ground and you have an RF signal, um, you will lose it. So that's why you get the idea of where the rocket's going. You go that way until you're close enough to pick up the signal non-line of sight again. Um, so it had been raining a lot and we couldn't drive. The roads were too muddy. If you know Argonia, you know, driving in the mud is a guaranteed way to not get back out of the mud. You get stuck. It happens every time it rains, somebody gets stuck out there, but not a lesson we needed to learn. So myself and Taylor and Matt, especially who stuck with me, we walked probably about six miles trying to get a signal out of it. Didn't have anything. That tracker at the time was one of the lower powered ones that I had bought from Comspec because it was cheap. And I think I think the line of sight on that thing is about five five or seven miles or something like that. So it's very, very possible there was enough wind up there that the rocket drifted outside of the range that that tracker could even be picked up with my receiver. And what I anticipated or what I thought was it coming down and disappearing was it just getting further and further away from us, but not coming down. And by the time it reached the limit of the tracker, it might still have been in the air. It could be in uh, Wichita, Kansas, for all I know. Maybe it'll show up. Maybe somebody will find it and have it. Maybe it'll be in the lost and found this year at Airfest. But I tell you where it's not, and that's in my possession. Unfortunate. But these things happen sometimes. That was the first time I ever lost a rocket. Um, I had one come in ballistic when I was 18. It was my first level one attempt. Um, I had been making charges the same way that I still do forever. And somebody was like, well, I don't know about that. You should try this. So I tried their method. And what do you know? It didn't blow my rocket apart and it came in ballistic. We don't need to get into that. Anyway, um, this is the first rocket I ever lost, lost. And... I don't have failures that often, which is super great. Uh, I don't push the envelope super hard, and uh, I tend you you run into issues the more you try and uh, break records and set things that are not records, but you know personal bests or you hit twenty thousand or Mach two or this or that. the The harder you push it, the more likely you are to fail. That's just how it is. Speaking of which, this is my Big Daddy 4-inch all-fiberglass AMW Big Daddy. I flew this at Airfest as well on a CTI 4-grain K740 C-Star. Four 
super, super sick motor. Uh, we flew that a few years ago in Texas in a uh, four inch dark star. And I believe it went a l little over 4,000 feet. So it's pretty punchy motor for this tiny little rocket. And I don't know how high it went. I don't care. I flew a motor deploy old school, just like an Estes rocket, but a really big motor. We put the tracker on it. And uh, that was it. We just sent her sailing. I think it simulated to around 6,000 feet. Tracker worked that time. Walked right to it. Got super lucky. It landed right in the middle of a nice dry spot of a plowed field. So I didn't have to go through the ankle deep mud or the milo or anything. Just right in the middle. It was perfect. And uh, yeah, so that, that concludes my Airfest flights for the year. And then from there... Like I said, I had never lost a rocket or had any sort of detrimental failure except for my level one, you know, almost 10 years ago at this point, eight years ago. So, um, I was certainly due for a couple of incidents and this one was very unfortunate. It was my wild man four inch punisher, uh, with a borrowed Aerotech 75 5120 case because my dad was also flying in a motor that weekend. Triple E Idaho has club hardware that you can borrow for your certs or just whatever. So like I said, I decided to fly another M2050 because I like the thing so much. But this time put it a 4 inch rocket. Uh, it was supposed to go about 19, not even crack 20,000 feet. But it was simulating to go Mach 2. So it was supposed to be my first Mach 2 flight. One. Um, it took off, it coned a little bit, and uh, it was it was moving pretty horizontally by the time it was hitting apogee so my theory on that one is that the charges couldn't uh, overpower the wind resistance from it flying horizontal the rocket came in ballistic tracker signal obviously gone brand new tracker we use it one time and then buried it with my four inch punisher it's gone don't know where it's at beautiful blue rouse tech 75 51 20 case is probably eight feet in the ground in the desert in idaho somewhere along with a rocket man shoot, a bunch of Kevlar, and a maybe salvageable 75 millimeter aero pack retainer. But I imagine that would be the only thing that would have survived. Anything else, yeah, it's done. It was definitely coming in hot. The crazy part is we could see it the whole way down. So I'd say it's probably somewhere between 16 and 19,000 feet, and we saw the whole thing. So, yeah, that was unfortunate. Old Ghost Rider's gone for good. And then my next flight would be Tripoli, Las Vegas, uh, Oktoberfest, flying the 7.5 inch Paper Iris from Lock Precision. Courtesy of Dave and Jay at Lock Precision, they bought me a K850 to fly that rocket after they gave me the rocket for free. So, you want to talk about stand-up gentlemen, those guys are pretty cool. So, uh, they, they got some really cool footage of it. Actually, if you go to the Lock Precision website right now, um, footage of the drone catching us setting it up on the pad and some really cool launch footage is kind of what they have the title imagery of on their website right now. So that's pretty sick. My rocket got to be their uh, little advertising campaign there. And let's see what else we got. Rockstock, I didn't fly anything. Obviously, I didn't fly anything at uh, the Evolution Space Launch. And I think that's about it. Yep, that's all I flew. It just was a lot of impulse because there's an N and two M's in there. I, of course, there was also some other stuff I didn't uh, mention. I believe the first Tripoli Idaho launch where I flew the first M2050, I flew my Pemtech King Kraken on an H550 and my binder design Excel that's older than I am on an H100. And then I brought that crew back out once again. I believe I did an I-180 in the binder design Excel and... Something else in the Kraken. I, I just know I flew it. What did I fly that on? I don't know. I feel like I flew a G motor in there somewhere too. Oh, I did fly something at Rockstock. I got a cool spool. A lot cool spool. And I flew that on a G... I don't know. 64. No. It was a, it was a single use. G40? I don't know. There's a bunch of little flights in there that I keep forgetting about. But overall, it was a fun year. I'd say largely successful we did have a couple of expensive incidents but that's just how this hobby goes sometimes 
like I said, we've got some really, really cool, exciting flights coming up for 2022. And if you thought the O impulse over the year 2021 was impressive, just know I've got one flight that is going to have that much, <laughs> that amount of impulse in that one flight. Uh, the Patreon supporters already know what it is. It's a seven motor cluster. It's O impulse. And uh, the template for the fin is sitting right behind the camera. And it is big so i hope you guys are looking forward to this year as much as i am i got a new job that's hopefully going to allow me to have a little bit more free time so we can get more stuff knocked out i got two l's at least and between myself and my dad i think at least three m motor flights no ends this year unfortunately but uh an o basically so that's going to be pretty crazy. And I thank you guys very much for being here all through 2021. The channel grew a ton and the involvement and everybody's comments and everything. It's been awesome. I appreciate all you guys for being here. So uh, like I said, 10,000 subscribers. Someone's getting a free rocket on Patreon. When I get 25 Patreon or Patreon supporters, someone's getting a free rocket. And uh, yeah, I just want to keep having fun. As long as you guys are having fun, I'll keep the content coming. And uh, that's going to do it for this episode of Rocket Vlogs. I'll see you guys next time.